everyone and welcome. I'm James Milan. This is Justice in the Balance and today we are talking with Lois Ahrens. Uh, Lois is the founding director of the Real Cost of Prisons Project and she is here to help shed light uh, for us today on a world that remains largely invisible to most people um, and that is being brought into the light a little bit more by the current, by the current conditions attendant on uh, the pandemic that we're all dealing with, but that is affecting the incarcerated population and populations in ways that uh, are much more dramatic on a number of levels than what the rest of us or many of us lucky enough to be in our own homes are dealing with. So first of all, Lois, thanks very much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for asking me. I'm sure you're really busy these days. It's amazing we how are. many folks we talk to who in this world of physical isolation, uh, just because of the nature of the work that you do, uh, you turn out to be busier uh, rather than less busy. Um, Actually, there are a lot of busy people. I mean, really, really busy people here in Massachusetts and people all around the country that are doing work uh, to decarcerate people um, a lot of us have been doing that work before this. Of course. And so now there's a greater emergency for decarceration. And so there is, there are a huge number of people, thousands, thousands around the country that are doing this work. And so I'm one of those people, but we are, we're working all the time. We're working <laughs> 10, 11 hours a day, seven days a week. If we're all home. This is what we're doing. Yes, and I know that your project itself is, is 20 years old now. So obviously you have been at this for a long time, way before, again, uh, the public attention may have been drawn uh, more to this issue as is the case at the moment. And let's yes. take advantage of that and, and talk about what is the story that is going on? So what is happening uh, right now? Just give us a, a, a quick sense, if you can, of what's going on behind prison walls right now here in Massachusetts? Well, uh, what's going on is there about, I mean, the first thing I should say is there are about a little over 14,000 people incarcerated in Massachusetts. And half of those people are in county jails <clears throat> and half are in state prisons. And the thing that unites all of them is that nobody can maintain six feet of distance between any other person. And um, unless, even if somebody, I mean, there are a number of prisons and jails now that are on lockdown, that is people are locked in their cells, often two people in a cell. So that makes it completely impossible. <clears throat> but even when they're so-called locked down, uh, people and even meals are coming to their cells. <clears throat> People still have to be uh, uh, walked out by prison guards to take a shower. Often those people are handcuffed. So people have to handcuff them. They have to walk them to the shower. Uh, they have to be in a shower, uh, possibly, you know, with other people all around them. They probably uh, want to make phone calls. Often they have to leave their cell to to make phone calls. So people are coming in contact with people, even that people that are so-called locked down. There's this idea if you lock people in a cell, um, even if they're in a cell by themselves, uh, that somehow they're not going to be in contact with other people. They will be in contact with other people. And some of the people, most of the people often that they're in contact with are, are staff and so guards and so um that means it's risky it's especially risky for the incarcerated people because the guards are coming in and out every day and even if uh, their temperatures are being taken which supposedly they are and even if people are wearing masks which supposedly guards are although we hear otherwise um uh they still, uh, 
if they're having their temperatures taken, they can be asymptomatic or so they can be walking in uh, with, um, with the coronavirus and uh, infecting everybody that they're around. And so uh, because of the climate of jails and prisons, I mean, this idea that you can be safely set apart is, it, it's, it's, I mean, it's basically, it's an absurd idea. Right. And so and it's like trying to stop this tsunami that's happening um, by, you know, taking people's temperatures. Yeah, it seems uh, certainly in conversations that we've had on our public affairs series, this one and, uh, and one on criminal justice reform that we've done over the last few years, it's clear that uh, that both public uh, sympathy for and attention that they're willing to pay and activism around prisoners' rights is a tough is a tough sell for lots of parts of the public, but hopefully this is uh, drawing people's attention to the fact that the situation that you've just described um, is, uh, is antithetical to what we are supposed to be doing um, in terms of uh, isolating ourselves and taking all of the measures that we're supposed to be taking uh, in order to keep ourselves and others safe. That simply, it seems, is not possible as you have just described within that context. Right. I mean, one of the things that, you know, um, the, the sheriffs and the Department of Correction, they are trying to ostensibly do the things that they can do to try to mitigate what is what I feel and what many, many, many other people feel is going to be catastrophe, uh, where there could be out of that 14,000 people, there could be thousands of people dying dying unnecessarily, dying because um, they weren't let out, uh, people that probably shouldn't have been in there in the first place, and that is people being held because they can't make bail, and or people who are being held because they have a probation violation, a dirty urine, or a missed meeting, or something like that. And so those people are uh, risking death. Um, because they're not being released in a, in a in way, in a quick enough way. And so, um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say what it is that's going to make uh, the general public uh, feel like this is an important thing, that it's a human rights issue, that it's a humanity issue. Um, because people can compartmentalize people that are in jail and prison as as what criminals and uh, criminals uh, that are deserving of the kind of punishment that people in Massachusetts basically think it's all right for people other people in Massachusetts to administer and other people to live through and so I don't I don't know if this is going to be the thing I mean I have to say that with all of the work that people have been doing since it became clear to us, let's say six or seven weeks ago, or I don't know, I, all, all these days have sort of blended. That's a blur. I mean, that's a complete blur. Uh, but whatever it's been, maybe up to two months, where we realized uh, what was going to happen and the kind of work that's being done by so many people, the response to that to all of our work has been almost nothing. And so, um, so it's, I mean, there's been a response of all kinds of people organizing to put pressure on the powers that be. And those powers are the governor, the Department of Correction, the sheriffs, the district attorneys, the parole board, all of whom have a role in um, and could play a big role in releasing people. And by releasing people, it means that they can uh, be in a place where they're li less likely to get infected, that is out here with the rest of us doing what we need to do. And 
for the people that are going to be left inside, which is going to be even in the best of scenarios, you know, even if we got everything we wanted, is going to be thousands and thousands of people. And if there were fewer of those, fewer thousands, there would be at least some possibility that some kind of version of social distancing, not six feet, but some kind of version of mitigation of the worst kinds of things uh, could take place. So it would have, you know, two releasing people would have two impacts for the people right. released and people inside. So you, you, you clearly decarceration, releasing people is, is, is something that you and others that you've cited have been working hard to accomplish way before this, of course. Um, I think people can understand uh, fairly, I assume, fairly easily understand how it would benefit uh, those who are in uh, jail at the moment for very minor offenses and for the other things that you've already mentioned that could or should uh, be released um, or who could or should be released um, in order to benefit all. I think most people can see the benefit for those folks in getting out of that situation. Um, pl make the argument, please, for for why it's better for everybody for that to happen. Why is it the address the concerns that people would have about having folks who were in that situ who were in prison released back into communities and therefore at least potentially uh, coming into contact with with others and who knows at what risk you mean on the risk that they that they're coming out and they're infected right and so right that they've been in a in a situation which is everybody would acknowledge high risk and now they're coming back into communities and one assumes without super you know without any kind of close supervision necessarily so i i'm just assuming that's the crux of what people uh who who would be very you know, uh, either frightened or at least uh, concerned about this possibility. Uh, I figure you've probably had to think about uh, about how you'd respond to, to folks' concerns. Right. I mean, I think, for, I mean, the first thing is, I mean, just to say that there are people that are going to be released um, uh, regardless of whether they are, are sick or not. That is, their sentences are up or they're released because they um, have gone through this process where they can be released uh, uh, their pretrial and they can be released on bail. And so those people can't be kept and shouldn't be kept in prison or in jail uh, because uh, there's the possibility that they're, that they're ill. I think that they could, when people are released, they could be tested if they were tested and if they were found to be positive, ideally what we need to do and what people on the outside need to do, and there's a lot of discussion going on about this now, and this was one of the things that was asked of the governor recently, and, and there are people working on it, most especially in the Boston area, that there are thousands and thousands of empty rooms and those rooms are in hotels that have their own bathrooms. They're in dorms that are empty. And so there are people at the various colleges, Tufts and Harvard, and I, don't, I think maybe BU, but definitely Tufts and Harvard, that are doing that kind of organizing now to uh, work with their administration to see whether some of those dorms can be opened up to provide a place for people who are um, being, we hope more people being released from jail and prison, and also people who um, uh, are homeless. And, um, and so, uh, so that's part of what the work of some people are doing is to try to find a place. And what we're saying is people need to be released and if people are sick, they can, you know, self-isolate and they can be in a room just like any of us that were tested positive would be self, self-isolated. And there would be, you know, much less possibility of other people um, 
of them coming in contact with other people than they would be if they were on the street or they would be if uh, they were in jail where they were coming in contact with other people they're incarcerated with and they're coming in contact with staff mm -hmm. every day. I mean, some, I just read a statistic, I to look for it, that in Framingham now, um, no, in the Middlesex County Jail in Bill Ricca, that six, as of, I don't know, this was a day or two ago. I mean, the numbers are changing very, very, very fast. They do, and hourly, it's few. As soon as they post them, they're out of date. So uh, in the Middlesex Jail, there were six people incarcerated who tested positive and 21 staff. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's like a big, a big difference. And um, in the, in, in uh, Framingham women's prison, there are 22 uh, women who are infected um, and seven staff, uh, including two medical staff. And that 22, 22 number is more than 10% of the total population of Framingham right now. Yeah. That's you, a very I, big number. Um, and, you know, I don't know how much uh, contact tracing and all of that is going on in those places um, and how thorough it's happening, if it's happening, to try to contain it uh, for the people who are being infected. But, I mean, I think the idea that we have to keep people locked up um, to protect people outside is... Um, an unfortunate idea. I think that people on the outside are working on trying to do this very thing, provide ways for people to find a place, live in a place, stay, stay in a place. Most of these colleges now um, uh, have canceled their summer sessions. Mm -hmm. And and so there's there's plenty of there are plenty of rooms out there. Yeah, and, unusually so, right? I mean, we have, again, this is one of the crazy consequences of an extraordinary situation that here you have one of the toughest places to find somewhere to live or stay uh, in the country. But now, because again, of this large, disproportionately large college population we generally have here, like you said, they're all empty. a lot of rooms available. I mean, thousands of rooms available thousands of rooms. Um, so, I wanted, sorry, sorry, I wanted Go just ahead. to follow up on, um, on what you just cited because I was reading earlier, I think uh, you had pointed us towards this article about that situation you were just talking about at the women's prison in Framingham mm -hmm. or uh, at the jail, um, in which, as you, uh, as you said, an extraordinarily high number uh, or high percentage of uh, the prisoners are uh, are are uh, infected. Um, are there any explanations for 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 why that could be? Because that I think is very very well, high, even compared to other to the populations in other prisons. I think uh, I think there's an older population there. Uh, women that have been sentenced have long sentences, mm -hmm. and so they're much more vulnerable. Just like other older people. Um, they probably have longer people are in prison, and this is true about other prisons in Massachusetts, like Norfolk Prison, where, I mean, Massachusetts has the oldest prison population in the country. I did not know that. Wow. And so this, this is going to be one of the impacts of it, as people have a lot of pre-existing medical conditions. A lot of people who've been locked up for a really long time, they're you know, quote, health care um, has not been the best so that right. they- One would been, assume their immune systems are more vulnerable than many. And they just have more things. They have had more, more respiratory things, more heart problems, more things that haven't been dealt with. And some of those things in the past and, you know, have been dealt with serious illnesses. I mean, I know people that have had that and have gone, you know, to try to go and get- um, medical care and they've been given, you know, two aspirins. And so that isn't the way to deal with people's significant medical care or medical issues. And if that accumulates over 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, those people are going to be a lot more at risk. And that's true about, um, and that's true about uh, the women at Framingham. And it's going to be true about the men at Norfolk. 
that are an older population of people. And I don't know, I mean, at some point, I don't know, somebody could probably say this, like how people have been grouped together, how the women at Framingham, you know, whether they're really in close quarters because so much of the prison is in such bad shape, like whether they've been put in smaller and smaller spaces. So they're much more apt to be able to, you know, uh, be contagious when you know, other people get it. So I, I, I don't know why they're, other than the fact that people are older and they probably have a lot of pre-existing conditions. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, you said earlier, you know, and rightly so, that, that the statistics are changing every time. As you, as you said, every time Absolutely. it comes out, it's outdated, you know, within a minute or within an hour, whatever it is. What are, what are reliable sources for if our audience is, is interested in following up? And I'm right. sure some will um, be. What are reliable sources for that information? Uh, the Prisoners Legal Services, uh, um, the website is uh, plsma.org, Prisoners Legal Services, Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. They have a page that's just a coronavirus page now. They're updating it all the time. I'm pretty sure it links to an ACLU page, which also has their own page, ACLU of Massachusetts about statistics about what's happening at every jail every prison i mean but there is a lag time i mean i noticed uh, i'm in hampshire county and i can't remember what they said the number was but today there was a i mean hampshire county only has a couple hundred people in it now and uh um they said there were just a few people but today in the paper they said there were a, out of that 200 or so, 11 people are infected in a small jail. And um, I'm sure, I'm absolutely positively sure that some percentage of those, they didn't say, um, are there pre-trial. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, you just know that about... <laughs> yes, because every jail and every prison, I mean, um, has it more... I was just looking at the Middlesex numbers on April 14th, there were uh, 371 people pre-trial and 261 sentenced. So the numbers of pre-trial people are always higher, always higher than the number of sentenced people. I mean, sometimes 60%, sometimes 70%. So that's that's way, and, and these people at minimum, at minimum should be, there was a Supreme Judicial Court decision on April Third, and they said that people that are being held pre-trial should be get get a new bail hearing within two days. Mm -hmm. And mostly that is not happening. I mean, two days have passed. That was April 3rd. Mm -hmm. right? And there are people that are being released, but not it's it's not the the response is not nearly uh, commensurate with the emergency. And why is that, do you think? Oh, because uh, the governor has done nothing about this. Um, uh, the guards union is resisting, uh, even though it's impacting them. Maybe yeah, it's great. I mean, it's I know it doesn't make sense, but nonetheless, that's really I, I mean, you would have to interview them. I can't I don't know why they I don't know why they are not doing more. I mean, to me, this might seems like a possibility of a time where the jailers and the jailed. There would actually be a confluence of their yes. interests. Yeah. You would think so. But so far, that has not happened. Uh, the guards union has not come forward with this at all. I mean, they're behaving the way they, they always behave. Mm -hmm. um, that prisoners are their adversaries and that people who advocate on behalf of prisoners are their adversaries. Does, I mean, again, I don't want to overly speculate but it does it does seem like it's kind of more of a knee-jerk reaction on on the part of the of the their union um, it's an old knee because it's an old knee and and I mean, it just doesn't it's, seem to again be yeah. to the benefit of their very own constituents there i, I know uh, maybe, I, maybe we're missing I, something who knows well i mean really they would have to speak for themselves uh, I, I can't, I don't want to, and I, I can't, can't. 
understand their thinking, so I can't even begin to speculate on. But I mean, they're all of these. They're all of these. Uh, we're in this situation because all of these actors that could be acting are not acting. Right. And so and you were you were talking about the, the governor, sheriffs, DAs, parole boards, etc. Um, are these these are the decision makers and the actors in this in this case? I assume, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is, is, is therefore the situation because there are. Uh, a certain number of DAs uh, and a certain number of sheriffs, obviously operating in all the different counties in Massachusetts. Uh, is it different county to county? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have someone like uh, Hodgson, sheriff of Bristol County, you know, who maintains that, you know, he's got no problem there and everybody should continue to be locked up. And basically <clears throat> the sheriff, uh, so I'm in Western Mass, the sheriff of Hampden County, runs a big jail, Kochi his name is, um, he also says, you know, we've, we've got this, you know, we're, we're, we're doing, you know, it's better for people to be in jail, people are safer, which of course is turning out to be not true. I mean, uh, last couple of days ago, the sheriff of Hampshire County, Kayleen, said people are, sa people are safer in jail than there are, they are out in the street. Well, now there are 11 people that are infected in his jail. So, I mean, it'd be hard for him to say this same thing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, some sheriffs, I think, uh, or some DAs and some sheriffs are um, trying to release uh, more people, but other DAs are behaving just the way they ought to behave. Um, and uh, they're not really, there are these bail hearings and they're coming up with all of these reasons why people shouldn't be released, not because they're not holding dangerousness hearings or anything. They're just coming up with these different reasons about why people shouldn't be released. And so, um, you know, and of course, their lawyers, lawyers can appeal those decisions, but all of that takes time. Courthouses are closed. Some courthouses are closed. You know, so everything is taking longer just at the time when things need to be hurrying up. Things are slowing down because everything is slowed down. Right. Because of what's happening. And I mean, so another example, I mean, is the parole board. The parole board has a lot of power to parole people. Three, 300 people have been on paper paroled by the parole board and they have not been released. Those people could become infected and die in prison because the parole board hasn't acted. There are many people that have applied for medical parole, compassionate release. Massachusetts was, I think, the 49th out of 50 states to pass a compassionate release law. We were, I can't remember, so we were one, if not the last, then the 49th. And since that passed, um, the Department of Correction has done um, and the parole board have done everything that they can to thwart those releases. Uh, people w waiting, dying, people dying before this, who uh, should have gotten compassion release, died before they got, got released, before they were able to be released. And so this is the mentality of them even before this. And so this is a continuation of that mentality both in terms of medical parole, compassionate release, and also in terms of paroling people that are eligible for parole. Um, help me understand a little bit better the, the role of the parole board then, because um, my, you, you said that 300 people have come up for parole and have not yet been released. Does the parole no, board- No, they've have been some, paroled. They've they have been, been paroled. paroled, sorry. And so they're in like a step down or a pre-release and they have, they have to wait for these certificates of release and they haven't done that. And, and so they the could- parole board that, that issues those certificates of release? Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. They, and so they haven't done that. So, I mean, these are people that literally have been paroled but are still locked up. Mm -hmm. And then there, and then there are all of these other people that could be, that could be paroled if they had a chance to come before the parole board, and if the parole board weren't intent, which the parole board always is, is instead of looking at the life of somebody, the life that somebody 
has been living for the last 20 years or 25 years, they are looking at what that person did when they were 20 years old and now they are 50 years old. And so they are retrying these people based on a conviction from 20 years or 30 years ago. And so um, that's been the mentality of the, of the parole board. And so they are disinclined to parole people uh, because of the way that they think and act. And so they, um, so this is, even though this is, again, one of these huge emergencies in terms of a life and death situation, they're not acting any different. I mean, so um, there are all of these examples of here we have this huge emergency of people's lives and everybody uh, is behaving, not everybody, we advocates, people, are, trying to, you know, do what we can do. But nonetheless, all of these other uh, actors, the actors that have their hands on the levers of power. Right. Basically, those in authority is what I think you're saying. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're doing business as, as usual. And business as usual is not the right thing. I mean, people say, you know, which is true, uh, you know, that people in Massachusetts, that Massachusetts does not have the death penalty. So Massachusetts should not have the death penalty. Right. And so that I've, I've, is, I've read a quote that said Massachusetts doesn't have it in law. It may have it in have effect. It in, fact. Uh, in fact, I should say, uh, if, we, if we are not more. Absolutely. And that's, that's, that's where we're at right now. That's yeah. where we're at. People um, are making so decisions. Let me ask you, um, it seems to me you just, uh, you, you've, you've very well described what you and advocates and the prisoners themselves are up against here, including the fact that, as you said, all the systems, and it's always systems that are operating here, right? All the systems are slowed down, um, whether it's courts, uh, lawyers filing appeals, things being able to work their way through the process. Mm -hmm. That all seems to be, you know, not, uh, not amenable to the kind of speed with which some things need to happen. Therefore, it's, it, my sense is that the most important actors in this case might be the district attorney, the district well, attorneys, because they're the ones who can actually make something happen quickly. Am I right or wrong about that? District attorneys always have a lot of power and they have a lot of power in this situation. They could be acting proactively. They could be being much more aggressive um, about um, releasing people. And um, one of the things we asked for, this was early on, was people who have 60 days left on their sentence to release them. You know, like, what difference is that going to make, really? I mean, other than for the people that are released. Mm -hmm. You know, district attorneys should not be as aggressively um, uh, uh, opposing people's bail. Um, people, district attorneys could, there are lawyers that are, are trying to um, go in front of district attorneys to have those sentences of their, some of their clients revised and revoked. District attorneys don't have to be opposing all of that. So there are all of these points, thousands of points, where district attorneys all around the state could be doing something differently from what they're doing. The other person that I, we have to mention is the governor. The governor has a power, has powers that nobody else has. The governor has, everybody that's appointed on the parole board is appointed by the governor. The governor can offer clemency, which is, uh, which others, other governors in other states are doing. Um, so, so there are governors in states doing that yes, right now. Yes, yes. In California, they're doing it. Um, there's a huge effort to try to get Cuomo to do it. Who, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of people that could receive clemency uh, in Illinois. So yes, there are. I mean, Cuomo hasn't, but other governors are. Mm -hmm. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois, is. Newsom is. So there are other governors that are doing it. I think eventually Cuomo will do it. But I mean, 
don't know what it's going to take for them to actually do it. But, uh, um, but, uh, but, but Baker could do this. That's part of his power. Um, and he, part of his power, I mean, there's a law that will allow him to furlough people. So he could be acting in a very, in a proactive way to do these things. Um, he could, there's another law, which there was a, a letter that was released uh, two days ago by the ACLU and the Mass Public Health Association that details all of these actions and powers that are reserved for the governor, for the executive. And he has, at this point, done none of those. And it details what's happening around the country and also is the case law. You can do this. And here it's cited that you could do this. And one of the things that is cited that he could do would be to um, open up um, schools and hotels uh, for, uh, that are not being used if he wanted to. I mean, so there are all of these things that can that he can do, and there's been a lot of pressure on him. I mean, so there was, you know, this letter from Mass Public Health Association. Yes, or I think it was yesterday or today, the uh, Greater Boston Interreligious Organization, seventy, it was a letter of seventy clergy. They had a meeting with Baker. Not all 70 went, but I mean, they, they represent 70 people signed on to this letter. There was a letter of 176 Boston area medical researchers and practitioners to Baker. There was, you know, a, a lot of letters from prisoners, legal services, and advocacy group, and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that have been communicating with him saying, let people go. And, and so far, there has been nothing. And so, you know, if people want to communicate with someone, I would say the top person on my list uh, would be the governor. Yes, but uh, <laughs> so here's the conundrum, right? I mean, we are looking, I think, and people who are listening to this, I imagine, uh, will be interested in what can we do? And it does seem like what you've just said is that pressure is being brought to bear on the governor and by influential people or organizations or groups of Absolutely. folks. Absolutely. And yet it is not having an effect. Um, yes. But nonetheless, would you, would you recommend that those listening who are exercised about this, that they again, communicate themselves by a email or phone calls or whatever with the governor's office? Is that, is that Absolutely. I mean, you can't, you can't leave a message on his phone machine because it's completely filled up, but I mean, conveniently so, <laughs> but you can write <laughs> not online. Taking phone calls anymore. No, no, not really taking phone calls uh, from the public. They're his constituents, uh, but yes. And I, the other thing I would say is, I mean, there was, uh, well, one other thing that I wanted to mention, there was a bill, it's called H4963. It was introduced by my rep, Lindsay Sabadosa. And it was, and it calls for a lot of these things that we talked about, you know, releasing people 60 days, people that are ill, pregnant women, you know, all of these categories of people. People can read the bill. It's uh, 4963, H4963. And, and, I'm sorry, you said H4963? Mm-hmm. Lindsay Sabadosa. Mm -hmm. And people can read that bill. And um, uh, out of 200 legislators, 30 or 29 signed on, which is a very dismal number. Yeah. So, I mean, at first we were looking with this bill, we were looking to the legislature to try to do something themselves, just like the governor has power, just like the parole board has power, the DA's legislature has power. And they have not exercised that power. And they and so I think it's important for people who are concerned about this to write to their rep and to write to their senator and say, this is a tragedy waiting to happen. And we want you to communicate with the governor. 
and we want you to fast, fast. I mean, now they're in this informal session. They're not even really meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, so they, to me, they've, except for like these 29, I mean, or so, I mean, some others, they've just abdicated their power. They've abdicated their power. Yeah, I don't know if uh, our reps in this area, who we speak to regularly, and in fact, earlier this week, we were talking to our, our one of our two reps from Arlington. Um, who is that? Uh, Dave Rogers. Um, and he, criminal justice reform, the rights of uh, prisoners and those who um, mm -hmm. are accused even, um, have been an area in which I know he and our other reps, John Garbley, have been working. Um, I, think Gar I think he did. I think he did. Um, I don't know I, I, I'd be surprised if they weren't. But surprised. I don't think Rogers did. Um, and the way people can find out is to go to the bill and it lists everybody that signed on. Mm -hmm. So that's, you can find out in a minute uh, by just going there and looking or you can write them and ask them if they did. And if they did, thank them. And if they didn't, ask them why. Yeah. You know, and if they didn't like that bill, why? If they didn't like this particular bill, why they haven't come what, a month ago? I mean, Lindsay's bill was way over a month ago now. Um, if they didn't like it, um, or they felt it should come out of the Senate, and not the House, or whatever all that is, um, you know, why they didn't uh, put together a bill that more people could support, mm -hmm. which they have not. So, um, so I mean, there's so many levels of possibility of action, and but the reality is of um, stonewalling, denial, uh, inaction, that um, it's very... Um, very, very, very sobering uh, to know uh, that this is what's happening in the state day after day after day. As we see these numbers of people being infected, we see no, now four people have died. It's, it's, it's just going to be more. It's going to be more. And people won't be able to say, I mean, I hope people won't be able to say, oh, gee, if we had only known about this, you know, we would have done something about it because the people in power do know about it and they have done nothing. So. Well, sobering indeed and um, frustrating undoubtedly to those of you who've long been in this, you know, working in this world. Uh, and, and I just have to say, very, very, very scary and terrifying for people who have loved ones in prisons, I, I, I'm in prison. I, I have a lot of good friends in Norfolk prison, friends of mine for almost 20 years, people that I communicate with all the time, all the time, people doing fantastic work in there. And I am very, they're older, older than me even, some of them. And um, I am very concerned about what's going to happen to them. And so there are many of us out here that are advocates, but also friends and loved ones of people who are incarcerated, who are really concerned about what's going to happen to them and uh, their treatment inside uh, if they get sick. Yeah, and so important uh, to get reminders again of that of the that very that very real pain. Um, yes, it is. Felt yes. Um, I, we're we're going to wrap up the conversation here. I I uh, almost feel mm, I don't know. Almost embarrassed to ask you this, but um, given all of the uh, you know, frankly, kind of d depressing lack of movement around this, um, even under the dire circumstances and everything that you have laid out. I'm just, I have to ask you, uh, is there anything that you are hopeful about? Anything, any, any kind of uh, silver lining or, or reason to, to think that things might get better? Um, uh, before we sign off, I think maybe anybody would be, would love to hear something like that. But of course, I'm not sure if there is an answer for that. Well, the, the answer I would give is, is that there are many, many, many more people 
here on the outside uh, engaged with what is going on. Um, calls that I used to be on that had maybe eight people. Yesterday I was on one, I think it was yesterday, uh, had 40 people. Um, I was on a call the night before last from people out here in Western Mass. Uh, they were all, except for me and one other woman, all young people, uh, most of whom hadn't been doing anything at all, interested, but not really. Everybody was signing up to do things for that we feel need to be done out here in, in Western Mass. Um, and I, I think that there are so many, there are many, many, many people that are alerted and are finding ways to be engaged because there are these very concrete things to do um, that uh, are joining this fight. And it is a fight to fight. And really it's a fight for people we care about, people you know, who we love their lives. And I think a lot of people are feeling that. And so um, hopefully um, even after this horrible, horrible time is over, uh, some of these same people will remain engaged in the fight because the fight is not gonna go away. This is, this is a product of the fight that we've been having all along. Well, and engaged in that fight you have been for a good long while and I'm, and I'm sure for a good while to come. Um, we wish you really the very best of luck in your efforts and those of those you, you work with. Thank you. Um, uh, and we appreciate very much you taking the time to talk with us today. Um, we understand a little bit more and, um, and hopefully those in our audience who have been listening will be compelled to take action themselves. Um, so uh, with that, uh, we'll wrap up the conversation. I've been talking to Lois Ahrens from the Real Cost of Prisons Project. Um, and thanks very much again for your time. Thank you, audience, for listening. I'm James Milan. This is Justice in the Balance. We'll see you next time. Thank you.